Our scripture tonight is taken from Isaiah. Isaiah was a prophet of the Old Testament. And at this time, the exile is over. And God is speaking through Isaiah to the people of exile and telling them that God's anger has cooled and it's time to go home. Listen for the word of God. All of you who are thirsty, come to the water. Whoever has no money, come, buy food and eat. Without money, at no cost, buy wine and milk. Why spend money for what isn't food and your earnings for what doesn't satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. Enjoy the richest of feasts. Listen and come to me. Listen and you will live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful loyalty to David. Look, I made him a witness to the peoples, a prince and a commander of peoples. Look. You will call a nation you don't know. A nation you don't know will run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, who has glorified you. Seek the Lord when he can still be found. Call him while he is yet near. Let the wicked abandon their ways and the sinful their schemes. Let them return to the Lord so that he may have mercy on them to our God because he is generous with forgiveness. My plans aren't your plans, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. Just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my plans than your plans. The word of God for the people of God. Thank Thanks be to God. God. So one thing I want to point out is that after the sermon, we will be receiving Holy Communion. And you remember, if you were here last week, we sang, eat this bread, repetitively, as we came forward and received the elements. And today, we're going to take it another, another notch. Um, our choir is going to lead us in this, and there's verses that go along with eat this bread. So they will sing the verses, and then we will sing eat this bread. Right, John? And we will just follow their lead. Wonderful. I know we can do it. Dreams are funny things, aren't they? Dreams. I mean, when you think about how odd that is to go to sleep at night and, in a sense, watch a movie on the back of your brain. It's, it, dreams have purpose, and I'm not an expert on dreams, but I've done some reading on dreams because I find them fascinating. And dreams have different purposes. You know, there, there are those kind of manic, stressful dreams where nothing goes right, where like when you're in college, it's the dream that you have a final and you can't remember the classroom where the classroom's at. Uh, if you're younger, it's the dream where you're in school and you can't get your locker open. Um, if, you are, if you are a pastor, it's the dream where you are preaching Sunday morning and you slept through it, you know? I mean, the, I have another one that's reoccurring, and it's um, I, I have to make a phone call. It's terribly important that I make a phone call. And first, I can't find the number, and when I do, the numbers are really little. And when I finally am able to dial it, the last number, I always goof it up and have to start over again. OK, those dreams will make you nuts. And you wake up from it, and you just, ah. Oh. But what I've read about those kind of dreams is really kind of cool. Your mind and your psyche will actually use that kind of a dream to purge you of some junk that you've held on to during the day, some kind of stress and anxiety that you've just sort of held on to. And it's just releasing it through those dreams. So you don't really have to deal with it the next day. So when I wake up from a dream like that, kind of stressed out, I actually relax. Because I realize that that dream is, is working for me. And I appreciate it. There's other kind of dreams that I just consider to be problem-solving dreams. When, when you have got something going on and you're trying to figure out how to do something. And it might be in your home. It might be at work. It might be in a relationship and you're trying something new, or you're trying to figure out a process, or it could be a lot of different things. And it's on your heart and mind, and you will have a dream. And the dream will give you an idea. Very rarely will it give you the entire answer, but it will somehow help you look at it from a different angle, and you wake up and you think, oh, yeah, yeah, that will work. I'll try that. Well, those are wonderful, wonderful dreams. And then there are times that I really, truly believe 
that God uses dreams as a kind of a door into us and, and to, to, to talk to us about things, to make us aware of things. I had a dream like that a number of years ago that has stuck with me forever. Um, it was after I'd found my faith, and I was an adult, I was about 40 years old, and I'd gotten really involved with the church, and I was coming to worship every weekend, and I was in a Bible study, and I was doing daily devotions, you know, and I was feeling really good about myself. I was feeling really good about my faith. I just figured I was just marching right along that faith journey trail, and I just thought I was doing so well, and I had this dream. In this dream, there is a banquet table, and it's, and it's a distance away, and it is amazing. It's about this wide and as long as the eye can see. It's covered in a white cloth and it is absolutely heavy laden with the most glorious looking food you've ever seen in your life. This is not a potluck. Now I like me a good potluck, but this is food that is just, it's exquisite and it's piled really high and it's drink and it's, and it's far as the eye can see and it just it's just beautifully presented, and, and it goes on and on, and, and it's like it's lit up. You know, it just sparkles, and it's, incre it's breathtaking. It's breathtaking. And I, and I see that there's just there's a few people around it. They have plates. There's a few people around it, and there doesn't seem to be any anxiousness about them. You know, there's no need to pile up the plates because it might not be there the next day. They're just kind of taking a little from here and a little from there and looking and take a little from here and a little from there, put it on their plate. They're kind of talking to each other while they're doing this, but it's just really very relaxed. And that's when I recognize that I'm in the dream, okay? Sometimes we have a dream and it's like watching a movie, and sometimes we are in the dream. So I recognize that I am in the dream at that moment. And I guess we're in a kind of a room because it turns out that I'm kind of back in a corner in the shadows, okay? So I can see them, but really they can't see me. And that's when I realize there's a plate in my hand. And I think to myself, just like that, huh, I can go, I can go be a part of that, I can go do that, I can go to that banquet table. And I look down at the plate, and you know what's on it? A peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <laughs> This is deeply <laughs> theological. <laughs> when I saw that peanut butter and jelly sandwich on my plate, I hesitated. I hesitated to go to that banquet table. I was looking at something I was used to, and I started to feel like that was a risk. To go to that banquet table would mean coming out of the shadows and into the light. Frankly, it looked like something that I didn't deserve, and I, didn't, I wasn't sure if those people who were already at the table would really accept me. And in that moment, I stayed in the dark. And then I noticed an incredible pain of hunger and thirst. And I woke up. And you don't think I didn't analyze that dream to death. <laughs> oh, man. I'll tell you what. I think in a really general sense, that dream, that dream applies to so many of us, to so many Christians, to so many people who come to worship every weekend or maybe in a Bible study and maybe doing daily devotion and reading the Bible and all of that. <coughs> I think the issue is we can't even begin to grasp the enormity of God's love for us. We can't begin to grasp it. God's love is so enormous, it seems too good to be true. It, it feels like a risk. And the thing is, you know, all I had to do was walk out of that dark corner with my plate. I could have just tossed the peanut butter and jelly on the way, and I could have had anything that I wanted. You have to step out of the dark to accept it, and even that feels like a challenge. Do you think that God's love is so big, and really what we are looking for, what we're comfortable with, is maybe a God who loves us, but in a way that we can understand. Maybe, maybe a, a love that's a size that we can grasp, that we can get a hold of, and that we can even maybe feel in control of. And 
And the thing is, when it comes to most of us, I don't even really think we often delve that deep. I don't really think we often go to this place of spiritual hunger and spiritual thirst. I think we can be really involved in great ways in the church with worship and study and prayer and, and working outside the walls of the church to make a difference for Christ in the world and avoid this whole thing of spiritual hunger and spiritual thirst. We don't like to be hungry. We don't like to be thirsty. And physically, we very rarely are. You know, I recognize that the economy has changed in the last few years and that our lives are very different. But really, truly, most of us, we're still eating every day. Most of us haven't missed a meal recently. And if you have, and if you're having issues with that, I want you to come and talk to me. For the most part, we have most of what we need. We have most of what we need, and we're used to being able to take hunger and thirst and quench it somehow. We don't understand chronic hunger, hopefully. Maybe some of you do. Maybe some of you had a time in your life when you did experience chronic hunger. If you are experiencing that now again, I want you to talk to me about that. We don't know what chronic thirst is. And we certainly don't understand what spiritual hunger and spiritual thirst is. We just know we don't like that uncomfortable feeling, that empty feeling, whatever it is. And so we try to satisfy that hunger, that thirst, that holy longing, which is another good way of describing that. That holy longing with that which does not satisfy. And what do we do? More often than not, we try and take care of it with more food, more drink, more TV, more shopping, more entertainment, you know, whatever it takes. And the other thing that I think is, is interesting when we look at this scripture is that we couldn't really be in a much different place or time than these exiles were. It's really hard to imagine that there could be something in this scripture that would apply to them and to us equally. In our scripture, Isaiah is addressing the exiles, and the majority of the exiles at this point were actually born in exile. They don't even remember their homeland. They've never been to Jerusalem. They've heard about it. They've heard stories, and it sounds great, and they really think they want to go, and at the same time, oh, it almost sounds too good to be true. They've become accustomed to what they know, and you get used to what you get used to. And the thing is, you understand with this scripture that Jana read for us, this isn't actually alluding to food and drink for the body. It's an analogy. It's food and drink for the spirit. And at the same time, this scripture was originally for people, these exiles, who absolutely knew what chronic hunger and chronic thirst was. This analogy really works for them. So God is calling them home. God is calling them home and saying, all of you who are thirsty, come to the water. Whoever has no money, come, buy food and eat. Without money, at no cost, buy wine and milk. Why spend money for what isn't food and your earnings for what doesn't satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. Enjoy the richest feasts. You know what? Sometimes we think, better the devil we know. And in essence, these exiles are standing in this dark corner with scraps on their plate. They have been invited to come home. They are being invited to, to have their hunger and thirst, their spiritual hunger and thirst, taken care of in the most extravagant of ways. And it seems more like a dream than anything that could possibly be real. How could God possibly love them that much? How could God possibly love us that much? I believe with all my heart this is precisely why Jesus came. Jesus came to help us understand who God is, what God expects, and to try and help us understand how much God loves us. And he did it how? He did it through preaching. He did it through teaching. He did it through healing. He did it through miracles, and on the night he gave himself up for us, he did what? He took bread and he took wine. 
common elements that would have been in any meal that these people would have eaten. He took these common elements, he blessed them, he gave them to his disciples, and in essence he said to them, every time you eat and drink, remember me. Every time you eat and drink, remember me. Remember my preaching, remember my teaching, remember my healing, remember my miracles, remember how much God loves you every time you receive, every single time. This Holy Communion table is a foretaste of the heavenly banquet. The heavenly banquet that we take part of when we move from this life to the next. God wants us to have a taste of it now. And when we receive the bread and the juice, what's happening is we are taking in these elements, food and drink, into our body, but it is not to satisfy our physical hunger and thirst. It is to satisfy our spiritual hunger and thirst. And the thing we need to keep in mind and always remember is that that heavenly banquet in heaven, you have a place at that table a place that is only yours and nobody else can take. And that is precisely why you have a place at this table, no matter what.